So what I wanted to talk to you about um, is basically some experiences that I've had in the past couple of years. Um, and then what I'd, I'd like to, to offer the industry going forward, part of this presentation will be a little uh, explanation of a tool that I've built for my risk group uh, that you can use and you can download and abuse and so forth. Um, so, so why should you listen to me? Um, there's not a lot of reason why. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what I have done and you can judge me on whether or not I've done a good job with my experience. Well, first off, I'm director of operational risk for uh, a US bank corporation. We're the smallest of what's called the too big to fail. So they have these banks uh, in the US and they say, these banks, we'll let them die if they screw up their capital requirements. These banks, not so much. And we're the very smallest of those banks. Um, before that, I worked for a company called Verizon. Uh, there, I was part of a team that did a, a report called a data breach investigations report. Um, and so I helped build that for a few years. Uh, before that, I worked for a penetration testing company, basically doing all operations except for the actual technical operations of the test. Uh, audit experience, social engineer experience. Um, but I honestly haven't thrown a packet in seven years. Just get that out of the way. Uh, before that, uh, I worked as a uh, COO for, and product manager for a firewall company. And before that, I was a uh, uh, sales engineer for an ISP who needed to tell their customers about these new firewall things and why they were important. And so I had to explain to folks why they didn't need the static packet filters on their little routers. They really needed some more security than that. That's how far back it goes. So. Uh, some level setting, I always like to do this with my audiences. These are core beliefs of mine. They're, they're fairly unshakable. First, there's no secure. If you ever worked with a penetration testing company, you ever worked with a, an organization, you ever played with stuff, you know that that's just not feasible. Um, risk is a hypothetical construct. That means you cannot reach out and touch it. It's something that we imagine in our heads. We can try and put actual units of measurement around it, but that's not always successful. And the third is that operational risk does not equal financial risk. We'll get more into that later. So for today, I'd like to talk about why risk management is broken, uh, changing to what I call the modern approach, uh, based on somebody else's work. Um, and then why should we do that? What does it mean to be modern, right? Um, and how we can go about doing that. So the big question, the big question is, why do most risk management programs suck it? Okay. Um, who here has a risk management program in their organization? A couple people. All right. Anybody want to tell me what the difference between your risk program and your audit program is? The accountability is different. Right. My problem with, uh, with this is that I've got, uh, basically, I've got an audit group that talks about risk. And I've got a risk group that focuses on the strength of controls. I've got all this redundancy. In fact, KPMG, some of your larger accounting firms, um, they're talking about convergence. I already know of one large US uh, uh, insurance company that is converging those. They keep the accountability structure the different, but in a sense, it's the same work. That's not sustainable, right? So if you can tell me, is there value to a risk management program outside of being kind of pre-audit? No? Well, it sucks. So the other problem I have is um, we're dumb. <laughs> um, so you don't take my word for it. Um, this is Dan Gear, and he's a really smart guy, much smarter than me. And he starts talking to us about how our measurement skills these days, well, they're mainly ordinal, right? Anybody know what an ordinal scale value is and what you can and can't do with it? Okay, good, because we'll get into that. <clears throat> Science is based on what's called a ratio scale or interval scale. So you have uh, Celsius is an interval scale. You have this zero and you have... But, and you can say, okay, well, one degree plus or one degree minus is this scale thing, 
ratio scales are, are bounded, a percentile, for example, 99th percentile, 97th percentile, 64th percentile, that's a ratio scale as an example. An ordinal scale, scale is I like things. Strawberry ice cream is a one. Chocolate is a two, right? <clears throat> we're not doing a good job. If science is based on using not ordinal but ratio stuff, we're crazy, okay? Here's an example of something that we all probably use. I'm not gonna call out the model by name, but it says the base equation multiplies impact by 0.6 and exploitability by 0.4, okay? This is pretty much akin, when you think about it, to saying jet engine times peanut butter equals shiny, and I want you to believe this, okay? I don't care if you have Spock and Scotty, Jordi and Data, Chewbacca, and the good doctor, you can't break the fundamental laws of how the universe works. It doesn't work that way. The other badass thing about this is, check this out, impact by 0 0.6, 0 0.6, exploitability by 0.4. Right? And what somebody's tried to do here is use decimals to trick us into ratio scale thinking. Decimals aren't magic, right? They're not unicorn turds, <laughs> right? Just adding one doesn't make it a non-ordinal scale. You have to think about these things, okay? So this is Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn's a philosopher uh, around the history of science. And, and what Thomas Kuhn taught us is that there is a difference between pseudoscience and protoscience. Okay, and in proto-science, you have somewhat random fact-gathering. I call this a metrics program, right? Oh, gee, we've got this many spam messages we blocked. You know, antivirus triggered this many times. Hooray. All right, a morass of interesting, trivial, irrelevant observations, um, and a variety of theories spawn from what he calls philosophical speculation. I call this a SANS top 20. All right? That doesn't mean those things aren't useful. Doesn't mean they don't have meaning. But really, the rigor behind those is not what we would call scientific. So, why are we in this state? Let's talk about risk. So we probably have at least a half a dozen languages uh, represented in the room. If you go into my English uh, Macintosh Apple dictionary, you're gonna find like six or seven different definitions. Webster's in English will have 12. What's very interesting is the Japanese, this is uh, from the Seven Samurai, uh, the Japanese had, until Western influence, had no word for risk. They're one of two such cultures to have that. And the question I have for you is, is did this, does this mean they didn't have any risk? Right, of course not. Okay, it just meant they had to be very specific about what they were looking at. Okay, and so I, I, when I have 17 risk analysts, uh, and when I talk to them, I, you know, and they're getting confused, I say, okay, pretend you're Japanese. Can't use the word risk. Now talk to me. So, we have in Western civilization three basic views of risk that I've encountered. The first is financial risk, okay? And financial risk has a positive and a negative return. So you have a young football player, he comes out, he's doing very well. well he, here, right, he has some career path as an investment for you. He can either be a superstar or he can be a dud, take your pick, right? But, but there you go. Now this is different from engineering risk, right, which we get from the Dutch when they were building, um, its origin is from the Dutch when they were building the dikes and reclaiming the sea. They wanted to see, you know, how often the sea was going to reclaim uh, all of their land and what would, how bad would that hurt? And basically you have a rate of decay. So you have that same young footballer, right? And he's operating at 100% and over the course of the match he gets tired, right? Maybe he gets injured. Okay, so his, he decays. And if you think about this, right, what we face typically is partially engineering problem, not a financial risk problem. Our firewalls don't generally operate at 110, 120% uh, uh, return. They just don't, they're not capable of it. Their system doesn't support that. Um, our audit-driven approach to risk management, let's build a risk register and find where all the risks are, lives here. Let me explain what I mean. Engineering risk. 
management finds the weakness and reinforces it. Anybody ever do vulnerability assessment? Right? So there's a bridge in Seattle that goes across the Puget Sound, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And in 1940, they opened this beautiful bridge. Here's a bunch of people all excited. What they found was in a gale, the bridge starts oscillating. Anybody seen the video of this on YouTube? A few people, right? Yeah, very famous, right? And of course, when steel and concrete oscillate, generally that tends to happen. They're not very pliable, okay? And you know, they rebuilt the bridge. Now it's, it's operating nicely. Uh, but the risk and control self-assessment, that's what RCSA stands for, the risk control self-assessment as we commonly perform it has this inherent risk minus our controls, subtract all the controls. Um, inherent risk minus controls equals residual risk. Anybody familiar with this equation, a handful? Yeah, that's how awesome is your bridge is what we're focused on here. Problem with that, of course, is that if you design a stupid bridge, right, it doesn't matter how many girders you add to it, you're still left with a stupid weak bridge, right? And eventually that's gonna fail. Also, engineering is neat, but wind doesn't have a motivation, right? Wind's not like, oh, I'm gonna go blow over here now. Nor do raindrops try to evade our umbrella, okay? So engineering is typically very difficult to, uh, as a risk discipline to apply to what we have, which is an intelligent, motivated attacker. <clears throat> In fact, there are a lot of people who believe what we're dealing with is a complex adaptive system. Complex system, anybody dabbled in complexity a bit? Right, so a complex system is basically a, a system of combined parts whose sum is greater than the whole. We get that right? Yeah, so you get these, uh, you push on the system in one place and way over here something unintended happens. I'd like to give you an example of that, a risk group that I know of. They got assumed by a large company. A large company had strong passwords on these devices, right? So not only did you have to have um, numbers and letters, they had to, there had to be eight of them. You had to have a special character even, right? You spent all this time entering it in. And what the risk group, well, they, they were used to a smaller password. And they got kind of ticked off, so they did some analysis. And what they realized was, this is great, you're more likely to kill an employee in a car accident trying to unlock their phone than to have a data breach based on a two simple character password. What do you think Audit did? You think they listened to this? No, no, no. Strong passwords, right? They rule. <clears throat> so you have this complex system problem. This is Dr. Richard Cook. Dr. Cook built uh, a little book based on his observations at, a, at a, uh, a hospital about failures in complex systems. And when, these are some interesting uh, excerpts from that book, and I wanted you to take a look at some of these, right? <clears throat> the complexity of these systems makes it impossible for them to run without multiple flaws being present. Again, who's got a vulnerability management program, right? Uh, they're individually in, in, insufficient to cause data. Right? Failures change constantly because of changing technology, work organization, and efforts to eradicate those failures. Okay. These are more excerpts, and here I've changed failure to risk. And it starts smelling like, okay, this is a problem space that I live in. And so, if you take this RCSA, and you worry about um, inherent minus controls equals residual, what you're initially doing here is establishing a point probability. Now, you may be doing it extremely coarsely, qualitatively. Maybe you're doing a better job. Maybe you're fooling yourself and you're doing quantitative risk. But the problem with that is there are a lot of people who are smarter than we are who say, you can't do that, right? So condescending Frederick Hayek thinks we're adorable. All right, and the deal is, what they will say is, you have to look for patterns in the system. So anybody want to tell me what this is? Flights. 
States, over the United States, right? Yeah, and you can see the pattern of the United States as it emerges. So there's a third piece I'd like to talk about, which I call medical risk. Uh, works in criminology too, various other disciplines. You're probably familiar with it, but I'll give you the background. Uh, Dr. John Snow um, is kind of the father of modern epidemiology, and what he decided was cholera wasn't because of bad wind, which was the prevailing thought at the time. And there was a, a, an outbreak of cholera in London, and what he did, and this, if you've read Tufty's book, you'll recognize this, this is in Tufty's book, uh, what he did is he charted deaths from cholera against uh, the X's, which are pumps for water, where people would go and get their water. And sure enough, in Broad Street, that pump right there had been built uh, two meters from a recently decommissioned cesspool. Okay? So as epide epidemiology, or this medical approach, has evolved, you get a handful of risk thoughts here that are relatively useful um, for them. And I think they could be useful for us if we stopped thinking about engineering risk for a bit. Um, and they are, in fact, in a complex system, like a city of London, they're, you, you, they're the means to find patterns, okay? Now, not all correlation is causation and so on and so forth, right? but at least you have an evidence-based understanding of what's going on. So, it's designed to find those. Why does risk management suck it? Well, because we're focused on how awesome is your bridge, not how much are you associated with failure even, or how good is your lifestyle. Serious question. Can you imagine if your doctor operated the same way you did, right? <laughs> you should be like this poor kid over here, right? And the other thing to note is that his mom and he, yeah, they're not exactly svelte, are they? They're probably Americans. Um, <laughs> their lifestyle isn't that great. So maybe if this kid would start eating Twinkies and Ho-Hos, right, and, and maybe ate a few vegetables, we wouldn't have to bandage him up either. He'd be faster, stronger, etc. Okay, so uh, we're not doing a great job in risk management. It's time we were, we were upfront and honest with ourselves about our approach and what it means. And what I'd like to do is talk about change, okay? And from change, uh, I mean, let's focus on how much risk do we have, why do we have that risk, and stop worrying about gobs and gobs and gobs of risk thing, risks in a register, right? Uh, the inspiration here, comes from this, uh, the link is there, but that's Society of Actuaries. Uh, and basically they sync uh, a lot of this traditional approach to risk management, uh, going back to the financial crisis uh, years back, right? Here's why it happened based on this risk management principles. Here's what you should do instead, okay? Uh, the second piece, that's Gene Kim. Uh, you might know him from a company called Tripwire, but what he's also done in his spare time is the IT Process Institute, and they've put out a handful of books called The Visible Ops. Uh, Visible Ops for Security basically says availability incidents, uh, what correlates well to that is how awesome your people, your processes are, right? So how many of your audits actually audit for experience and qualifications? Next one, this is what I got to work on. That's Dr. Tippett. He's both a medical doctor and a PhD and a pilot. Um, and basically, the data breach report that I, I worked on, that's an epidemiological approach to examining uh, failures, uh, data breaches, right? So the modern approach to risk management, I'll give you a quick three-part manifesto to this uh, based on that stuff. First, uh, risk management must provide value, must address the need and it must be ethical. First clause, to be ethical, we have to become data scientists. And biostatistics Ryan Gosling suggests that maybe you look into Bayes' theorem a bit. Uh, that's a little stats joke for folks, sorry. But it's actually fairly easy what Ryan has to understand. You have three essential sets of information. Uh, this is a, a basic diagram, don't take it as gospel or anything. It breaks here and there if you push on it. But you have the threat landscape, information about your threat, information about your assets, information about your impacts, and information about your controls. 
Where these sets overlap, you have the ability to model and gain knowledge, and where they all collide in the center, you have risk. You do not have risk if you don't have all of them in an equation, okay? You may have something akin to risk, but it is not risk. Without impact, you cannot be talking about risk. Without controls, you're talking about this crazy inherent risk thing, which doesn't really exist, actually, but that's a different talk. Uh, within this, what we've done is we've taken this concept. You need a framework that describes reality, data about that reality, and it models to help you gain wisdom. So basically, you have this holistic view, right? Your framework should describe everything in that set. The data that you collect, right, is going to be about those individual parts, and the models are, is the synthesis of knowledge, and there's a feedback loop right there, correct? Okay, so at where I work, we quickly figure out a handful of things. First, we have to be data-driven. We must study the individual parts, uh, then the relationships between those parts, and then only then can we really start thinking about the whole. And the third, so what we're using is what I use called Verus, and Verus is publicly available. It's under a, a Creative Commons license. Verus as the framework, okay? Uh, Verus has, is an object-oriented approach, and it talks about an agent, so internal, external partner agents, and those have metadata uh, under hierarchical metadata associated with them. Agent and action, right? So you have error, you have hacking, which is actual, uh, um, different from malware because hacking involves a, an actual touch uh, or a decent script. Malware, which is the software itself, misuse, uh, where you've given somebody privileges and they're abusing those. Social, physical, environmental. You also have attributes so, uh, and assets. So you have an asset like a web server, an, as, uh, an attribute like confidentiality, integrity, or availability. So an agent acts, a, acts action against an asset causing an attribute to be compromised. Does that make sense? Right, and so this is a really big ontology we built for the Verizon data breach set that I'm now applying where I work. The third thing we figured out is we're looking at a boatload of data. Okay, so how big of a boatload? Well, this is, uh, this is really cool. This is, I, I wish I had built this, I didn't. Um, but I, li I liken this to our version of that Tufty di diagram. Across the top, you have the actions and the agents, right? And uh, across this axis, you have the assets and the attributes. So servers, networks, user devices, malware hacking, so forth, right? And then out of all of the secret service, Dutch high tech crime unit and Verizon data, here are the frequencies with which those failures show. How big is a boatload? Well, this is just high level. Verus has millions of squares. If I start uh, applying it to operational risk, I'll need to add more squares. Millions and millions of squares, how big is a boatload? It's big. And I pretty quickly figured out I'm gonna need a bigger boat. You may see Jaws, the point where the, the fish <laughs> swims by, it's like, oh, yeah. yeah, that's how, that's how uh, I looked when I realized this. So, the good news is, the organization I joined had a security data warehouse already with uh, 120 plus terabytes of information in it a year ago. We're, we're now much more than that. And we can look at this warehouse in the context of Verus extended for operation, all of operational risk. Use the data warehouse in order to actually do evidence-based approach. So how do we deal with a boatload? Well, we use Hadoop, okay? We also have um, uh, Postgres, we, ha we have a lot of technologies but the core information is in Hadoop, right? And so uh, this, uh, it's a fairly fundamental data warehousing diagram, but here again, we have our, our cute colors around the data and where we're getting it from, a MapReduce process, a uh, Hive, um, and or Drill, if that ever gets a little more uh, awesome, uh, and then I can pull that out. My GRC platform is not Archer, my GRC platform is not metric stream. My GRC platform is Hadoop, Hive, R, Python, Excel, right? We get much more meaning out of that than we would have spending millions of dollars 
on a GRC box. How do we deal with a boatload? And this is conceptually, we're just taking, finding these bits of data in the wild, dropping it in there, and then I can make sense out of it. My analyst groups can. Okay, and this is uh, a diagram that we built for uh, onboarding a vendor. We onboard a vendor, we stopped collecting hundreds of controls, we threw away that craziness. Anybody ever have to fill one of those nonsenses out? You know, lie to me 250 times so I can onboard you as a vendor? A couple of people, yeah, that's a pain in the butt. Um, I, start, I decided I'd stop making people lie to me. And so we collect a, a handful of information about them and we throw that in. And what that happens is that becomes a piece of intelligence. So what we've done is we've tried to deconstruct things, almost a genomic approach in what we do, where Hadoop allows us to store all of these pieces of the, you know, the organization's genome, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, back to intelligence, clause two, this is really important to me, given my background. Look, risk management's useless if it doesn't support counter threat operations. What's the most important thing a security department does? Stop bad guys. Right? It's, it's relatively easy. So we have a counter threat operations. It's kind of like re half uh, proactive forensics, half reverse pen testing. Okay? <clears throat> and what we started doing is, is, for example, you can track any piece of data through this analytical process that we've instigated. Okay, and we realized pretty quickly that risk management is just an intelligence function. And yeah, that was a big load of duh <laughs> uh, for us. But what we allowed us to do is say, well, we have types of intelligence and we have our role in this, uh, the information types that are, are really applicable and the tools that we use. So real time supports counter threat operations. Our role is relatively low there, we give people parts of the roadmap, part, uh, we actually do call it map uh, process, not like map reduce, but in like an atlas of what's going on. And then when new threat intel comes in from counter threat ops, uh, from FSI SAC or Roadhouse or whatever, uh, what we're able to do is then say, oh, well, they focus on this stuff, we don't meddle in it. There's no need for the bureaucracy. The main information that we're giving them is basically some asset information. And then they have controls that they use. They have Hadoop, uh, streaming versus you can use Storm, uh, Kafka. I've never used, but that's a, another stream processing piece. You got Hive, Dremel, Drill for searching and so forth. Uh, tactical security operations, right? Uh, we work with them. Um, we're giving them information about state. So the identity access management, the firewall rules group, you know, all of these other operational pieces um, that aren't specifically counter threat ops, we work with them. And again, they use much of the same stuff. Uh, strategic intel, we push up the food chain. Actually, I have uh, 14 CEOs that I report to, 14 risk management groups, because we're a bank corp, so I actually push it out a whole lot uh, through this strategic uh, angle. All right? any questions on that? Okay, so that's how we approached it. What's important here to note is also that, that you need feedback loops. Counter threat ops needs to talk to me, I need to talk to them. Uh, you know, I need to be able to distill what's going on in counter threat ops up the food chain. Uh, a huge piece of what I do is just put it into business speak for folks. Um, but basically the feedback loop is an important piece of this. If you don't have that as you craft a, a new form of operations based on data, it, it's gonna be difficult because you're not really testing and revalidating hypotheses. All right, so uh, I was listening to a CISO talk and uh, he was of a major American corporation and he said, we can, you know, the future is going to be uh, basically deparameterized assets in the cloud and there's no trust at the end state. Okay, that, that's fine. Throw all your stuff in the cloud and don't trust any of it. Sounds good. My assertion is this. If you, if you build out a, a real data warehouse, if you hire a handful of those Ryan Goslings, we have three uh, modelers. Sweet, I call them the sweet, sweet Bayesians in fraud. I have two modelers myself. If you start doing that, um, actually, the primary controls will be behavioral analytics um, and some machine learning and 
some languages to do that in. You know, uh, so some examples. Uh, so we do put everything in. So like HR systems, for example, you connect to our network. Uh, we capture your MAC address, and then we watch everything you do, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, we can watch in real time by your MAC address, link to your cost center. Oh, what systems are you touching? We know the process, right? The process map for wire transfer, that's defined and stored in Hadoop. <clears throat> Why are you touching something else? Right, so that, that's interesting information. The time of connection, so uh, hooking your badge system in, right, stream from the badge system and stream from our proxy. Well, that's weird. <laughs> Why are there port 80 connections happening from this guy's desktop when he's not in the building? You know, um, uh, riskiest cost center, this is my favorite. So you get to go to somebody or somebody's boss, even better, or somebody's boss's boss, and you say, hey, your cost center, right? Let's look at all the assets you have. Let's look at what your employees are doing. Let's look at how much, what, what value you provide to the organization. Your cost center is in the top 10 percentile of risky cost centers. Can, can we work on this together, right? Because nobody wants to be graded against their peers on a risk-by-risk -risk basis, right? My third clause is this. Um, you have to support rational decision making. So I'm gonna fly through a couple of these. We use uh, FAIR for scenario analysis. So if you're familiar with the factor analysis of information risk, Bayesian belief network for scenario analysis. And we use something that I'm calling Virgo because I'm, I'm really creative um, for state analysis. And that's basically Veris inspired risk grading for operational risk. So how much risk do I have? How well am I living? Uh, this is a, an example of a fair analysis we did, sanitized and had the values changed, but basically your analysts start giving relatively subjective inputs into the Bayesian belief network, um, and you come out with, you run some Monte Carlo simulations, and you come out with a actual risk value that has units with it, frequency and dollar, time and money. That's what all businesses really care about. Okay, so that's kind of fun and interesting. Um, Monte Carlo simulations, for those who aren't familiar, uh, basically uh, you run, you, you take these various distributions, you compare them against each other, and you do it a lot of times, and this is what happens. So you have, uh, these are unfortunately, I don't like this visualization method because it's logarithmic, but you can say, oh well, it's pretty obvious here that once every 10 years, we're looking at risk Somewhere between, oh, you know, half a million and a million, a little over. That's our greatest concentration uh, uh, out of the scenarios. What we do instead is we match those simulation results to qualitative labels that are assigned to quantitative scales. I grade those out uh, for, the, for it. And so what we're able to do is we're able to say, well, this is moderate risk, because not all of, the, of our bank corporation is doing quantitative analysis. This is moderate risk, well why? Well, because the impact out of 3,000 simulations was nada. The likelihood, however, well, it's, it's relatively likely for you, right? And so that, that you know, and, and these are, are scalar, right? So that's actually kind of meaningful for executives who have no idea what we're doing, but they know big red circles are bad versus small green ones. <clears throat> the Virgo scorecard, this is a mind map. Um, I couldn't give you an actual scorecard example, my apologies, but I was allowed to give you a kind of the mind map that we use to develop it. Um, ignore the compliance piece, yes I have that. We all know what compliance is. Um, but what we do is we're we are actually able to say, hey look, your business unit, your, <laughs> your only HIPAA business, you, you know, uh, uh, HIPAA is our, our healthcare law in the U.S. You're our only HIPAA uh, relevant business unit. So you have risk elements there, risk factors, uh, risk determinants, if you remember medical risk uh, terminology, these other folks don't have, right? and that's kind of a red light. Um, but we take all of this information in, this, this actually goes out several levels, uh, where we map it into the information we take it in and how we take it in. All right, so I promised you a tool. How are we doing on time? 
Good? OK. So I promised you a tool um, that I call the risk fish. <laughs> um, so the problem space can be really confusing to talk about. I remember once we did a, a I, was, I was doing a conference. It was the first time I'd ran into a chief, risk operate, uh, a chief risk officer. And it was one of the largest credit unions in the United States. Um, and we had the CISO, the CRO, the CFO, the CEO, all kind of on the call, right? And the pen tester saying, you know, found this issue, right? And so the CISO goes, that's a threat, right? And the, and the, C, the CFO goes, you know, that, that's a vulnerability, right? And the CRO goes, that's a risk. Yeah, great, you know, and, and you can get very frustrated with these semantic games, believe me. Um, the other thing is people naturally gravitate towards fixing that symptom, right? It's much easier to pat, you know, buy a WAF and throw it down than to try and talk your developers and not be in jackholes, um, you know, and, and coding poorly, right? So, uh, <laughs> and because we tend to try and reinforce those girders rather than root cause, I tried to do something a little different. So. This is, um, I'm not going to try the first name, Ishikawa, um, and he built uh, quality circles, if you're familiar with Toyota quality management. Um, and he built a, a fish diagram for manufacturing. So you have these measurements, materials, personnel. And the idea here is you take this worksheet into your quality circle. Basically, everybody in the room that wants to talk about the problem, the issue, this threat, vulnerability, risk thing, right? And you say, well, we've got this defect. Why did it happen? Here are all the sub-elements, OK? And so what I've done is I've actually taken this Veris thing that we used at Verizon, um, extended it a little bit for my use, um, and I've made it for risk management. So you remember those, those circles that I showed you and their, and their interconnections and so forth, right? Um, if you know. Uh, and, and it's easily referenceable on a worksheet, on a different sheet of the worksheet. If you know the lower level diagrams, you can walk through this worksheet with, your, with an analyst, a security person, an executive, whomever. You've got some risk issue. Well, what are the agents we care about? Let's have a conversation of the most likely agent and their most likely actions, right? Motivation, well, what motivates them, right? So if this is the cyber fighters of Al-Khazad, um, what's going to motivate them is, is an availability utility attack against me. That's going to cost them money. They're going to do it hacking denial of service, and we can get into the specifics of the denial of service stuff, which I'm told I can't do, even though everybody knows it, um, against assets, right? And the assets that, they, that the intelligence tells us they're typically doing are controls um, that we've identified here that'll help us with that. Right, so we can quickly go through that worksheet. You have a software developer who, who is doing a really craptastic job, right? So you have an internal agent. Um, they have error as an action. Uh, the asset is your software. The attributes, uh, call it integrity, um, depends on how bad. They could be all six, right? Uh, the controls you have, and now you can talk about the controls. Now, this, some of this is self-evident. My guys don't always fill out a worksheet every time they talk to each other with every conversation. But if you get into a position where somebody says, what do we do about this? Why, do we, why are we doing this? If you are creating a data warehouse and you want to put stuff into it that has meaning, this is essentially your tag system. There, there shouldn't be a tag missing. So if you want to download this, it's available both at the Society of Information Risk Analysts site, um, and you can go to the Veris community site. I think there's stuff there, too. Uh, but that'll give you the XML schema for Veris that you can use yourself. This is available under a Creative Commons license, and it's freely available for download. So I'm going to close uh, like The Daily Show, for those of you who've seen that, in your moment of zen, which is this. Remember we talked about uh, Japanese having no word for risk and, and how I encourage my analysts to, to not use the word risk when they're talking to the business? Because it facilitates that. <clears throat> Honest to goodness, the moment you can go like an entire month and never use the word risk, 
to describe anything. You don't use the word risk as a crutch. That's the point you know that you're doing a decent job at, at risk analysis. Okay, and I would encourage all of you guys, right, when you're talking uh, to folks, stop using the word risk. Tell them what you're talking about. The word risk, especially for English speakers, is a crutch. So, um, there's a really good chance that risk management will be redundant. If risk management becomes somewhat redundant versus audit, we're gonna lose a lot of stuff. And, and the things that we will lose, basically, is the ability to help each other in terms of intelligence, okay, in terms of communication, and in terms of trying to go away from an audit-driven or a standards-driven approach and pretending like becoming ISO 27001 certified has any sort of bearing on whether or not you're secure. All right, that's my, uh, that's my presentation, thank you. I'll be glad to take questions. You mentioned that you have a methodology in which you have data on one side and you apply models. I was just wondering, how do you assess the quality of, of a model in particular? How do you determine a baseline to compare it with? Great. Red 5, checking in. Um, so, uh, uh, data quality and model quality are two different things, okay? Uh, data quality, uh, you actually need audit. The audit's got a great role. I'm not trying to get rid of audit. I'm just telling risk management, look out in this. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, data quality uh, is, is something that you have to mind. Um, false positives are a problem no matter what in, in that. Um, fortunately, correlating things becomes easier. So, as an example, False positive in a vulnerability scan. This looks like it's an Oracle database. You know, it's not really because we know that that MAC address was signed to you know, this AS400 over here that doesn't run anything and we can pick up a phone and call somebody who says, there's no Oracle on the AS400, right? I'm like, no, okay, good, right? Crazy so stuff. For, for, the, mo so for, for the data quality, you, you can, that's relatively simple. For model quality, that's harder. Okay, so a model is nothing but a hypothesis. You mean a model in the sense of a predictive model, right? Correct, yep. correct. And that's predictive about the future or the past or the present as well. Most people don't realize that, but when you have a huge amount of uncertainty in the landscapes that you're dealing with, you actually have, you have to be predictive about the past and, and about uh, what, what's currently going on. So um, for uh, your modeling, you really need to in, investigate, um, uh, and this is why I'm, I'm so keen on uh, the use of Bayes' theorem, right? Model selection, right? Model updating, um, establishing the rational model itself. Uh, value at risk is known to be a broken model for financial risk. And yet, most US organizations still use VAR as a means, right? Why? Well, the answer why, why is because the, the regulators really aren't, <laughs> probably aren't, uh, yeah, well, they are smart enough at a higher level but nobody's forcing them to, right? Nobody's saying, well, let's try it, because that's hard work. Um, for fraud analytics, the model has to constantly update, right? The signatures have to be made relevant for the latest variants of Zeus or whatever. Um, so that model updating uh, and quality uh, in our organization happens very, very rapidly uh, based on this intel. That's that tactical piece that uh, I talked about. I guess about. you use like several metrics uh for example, I don't know the, the number of uh, false positive, the number of something, and using these different metrics, you say, okay, model A is better than model B. Or yeah, yeah, sure, right? Account takeovers, right? Now, you, you have, uh, I cut out, for the sake of brevity, my data uh, quality slides. Um, I actually uh, borrowed from the UK's evidence-based uh, medicine approach, uh, so, some, if you're familiar with that, it goes from A as the top evidence to D or D or E, I forget which one, as, as the worst evidence. You know, E is, is basically shamans, you know, 
applying leeches and, and crazy stuff. Uh, the problem is you're dealing in C's and D's many times, and that's again where uh, stochastic or inference-based stuff can, can help. Uh, it's not easy. Many times you're just too busy to really do even a good job, unfortunately, but at least you're doing better than uh, you had before. Thank you. Sure. No? All right. So uh, uh, I want to thank you all very much. I'm sorry if I talked too fast, uh, but I had a lot of slides I wanted to go through. Um, and uh, let's all uh, go have a beer. Thanks. <laughs>